A few weeks ago, I was in Nashville with my daughter, went to a Lego convention, had a great time. On the way back home, I wanted to stop at a record store called Phonolux. Never been in there before, but when I walked in, I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. They have records everywhere. They have cassettes for sale, CDs for sale. They even had eight tracks for sale. I bought an eight track player and some eight tracks just to play around with and give them to somebody who I really, really like. A little bit sweet on. Um, also bought some records there, but while I was there, I noticed that they had these Infinity Primus 360 speakers. The reason I wanted to try them out is because I know that these have really good measurements and I wanted to see, well, the measurements that we got are from the manufacturer, not from me, but I wanted to see, do they actually measure that good? But more importantly, how do they sound and how do the speakers sound compared to their measurements? So I went ahead and bought them and brought them home with me listened to them for about a week, and then put them on my Clipple near field scanner and measured them. This is purely academic. You can't buy these anymore. They cost about 600, 650 bucks back in 2005 when they came out new, which today's pricing is about $1,000 for the pair. But I got to tell you guys that after listening to these and then after seeing the measurements, I'm starting to realize more and more that a lot of today's speakers just flat out suck. And listen, I know that you can say that, well, today's speakers have different coloration to them on purpose. The problem is there's a lot of, I won't say mistakes. There's a lot of leeway in the speaker designs being made. And sometimes when they don't sound great, or maybe they don't measure great, what we're told is that, oh, well, that gives it character. That was a design choice. Sometimes I believe that. Sometimes I don't. Now, do I think that I can design a speaker better than some of these brands? Maybe all of them, certainly not, but it doesn't take away from the fact that 20 years ago, there were speakers out that cost about the same price as what we're paying today. And they sound far worse today than they did 20 years ago. So I'm going to use this as an example to show you some of the things that I heard with this speaker, how it relates to the measurements, what you were getting for your dollar back in the day and what's primarily changed. Have we really come a long way in our understanding of speaker performance relative to measurements? How much do measurements influence today's designs? Well, we know that again, that's gonna vary from speaker manufacturer to speaker manufacturer, but do these speakers that were built on the principle, literally of the Spinorama measurements being a certain way, sound good? Do these speakers sound good because they measure a certain way? We're about to talk about that. And we're also going to dive into some of the things that have changed over the years and some of the areas that speakers today have improved. First of all, let's talk about some of the specs. This is a three-way design, eight ohm nominal impedance. Its spec sensitivity is 93 decibels, which is about three to four decibels too high. It features two six and a half inch mid woofers, a four inch mid and a three quarter inch dome tweeter. Let's talk about my listening. Now I've had the opportunity to listen to these on basically two different setups. One would be with the Yamaha RN2000A stereo receiver. And then I listened to these speakers through my mini DSP Flex HTX, ran into a pair of monoblock amplifiers from March Audio, the P501 monoblocks. Initially, I set these up somewhat close to the wall because they just look better when they're closer to the wall. Bringing speakers out way out of the room my TV is mounted to the wall. It just looks kind of funny. So normally that's where I start with the speakers close to the wall and then I'll start bringing them out and I'll play around with aiming. I aimed them directly at me. Close to the wall, aimed directly at me. Top end was a little bit too much for me, aimed directly at me. So I wound up towing them out a little bit. And I tried 30 degrees off axis and to me 30 degrees off axis was just a little bit too far away. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by on axis versus off axis, here's a quick graphical example. Black is on axis and red is off axis at 30 degrees. Anywhere in between black and red is some other form of off axis by some angle. What I wound up finding was that about 10 to 15 degrees off axis worked the best. It was the better balance between getting the mid range to the tweeter handoff right. Otherwise, with the speaker pointed directly at me, it sounded like the lower treble was just a little bit too elevated. Sometimes it became sibilant, maybe you might call it bright. When towed off axis at 30 degrees, it was too much. I was losing, it felt to me like I was losing too much top end compared to the lower treble. And see, that's the thing about listening to speakers and trying to quantify their sound and then relate it to measurements. These things are all relative. So where I hear maybe a little bit of brightness, you may hear a little bit of dullness in the mid range 
Or maybe I say the bass sounded a little bit too boomy and you may say the high end sounded a little bit too thin. So these are all relative. And that is really why I like having graphical data to talk about, hey, this is why I heard what I heard. The mid range, no problems. Sounded silky smooth, buttery, chocolatey bottom end, all those great things. Well, chocolatey lower mid range bottom end. But when you got to the lower bass and the mid bass area, the thing that I noticed was that these just didn't really perform well below about 50 Hertz in room. They just kind of dropped off pretty quickly below that point. The other thing that I noticed was that with the speakers placed close to the wall, there was a little bit of extra boominess that I personally didn't care for. So I wound up bringing them off a foot from the wall. And if you don't know what I mean, here's another example of what I mean. When I say off the wall, I'm talking from the back of the speaker to the wall. So I bought these speakers out about a foot off the wall or a third of a meter off the wall. And that alleviated that lower boominess. But in doing so, I just felt like maybe I can bring them out a little bit further. So I brought them out a little bit further and then I wound up settling on about one and a half feet. That's where I landed, where I felt that I've got a good mix of nice bass output without it sounding too boomy, but also aesthetically pleasing because like it or not, aesthetics is a major factor. I know people that will go out and spend six figures on speakers more because of how they look and less because of how they sound. I've been told this by probably three or four different people with more money than I'll probably ever have. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a balance. It's a balance of sound. It's a balance of looks. It's a balance of what you like and the overall performance. So when I say that I brought them out about a foot and a half, that was where I liked the look of it. I liked the look of them about a foot and a half off the wall because they didn't sit too far out into the room, but they also sounded good. They were mostly neutral except for still that top end peak just a little bit. But what you can do about this, and I'm gonna show you in the data, is you can add some acoustic absorption to the sidewalls. I actually just have some panels sitting around my room, or not around my room, in my garage, and I use them for that kind of thing. So I'll put panels up and things like that and test stuff out. And when I did that, it seemed that it took away about a peak around four to five kilohertz and took a little bit of sibilance out of the music that I was listening to when the speakers were towed out about 10 degrees. Is that a sided bias thing, it could very well be. Me knowing that I'm putting up panels makes me aware that I should expect this kind of effect. Maybe so. So now let's talk about the data because this is more of an academic exercise or research project, if you will. And I really wanna relay to you, hey, when I said I heard this thing, this is where I'm seeing it in the data. And I also wanna relay the fact that I don't have golden ears. I believe that if you sat down and listened and I asked you questions, you would probably say, oh yeah, that is kind of what I'm hearing. I wouldn't try to lead you into it, but I would say, are you hearing this kind of thing? Or are you hearing this kind of thing? And I think that most likely you're gonna wind up hearing the same kind of things I hear. It's just that I've been doing this for such a long time that I've gotten pretty good at identifying what I've heard compared to the measurements. And when I listen, I listen first. Now I've been doing home audio measurement testing review stuff for like four years, but I did car audio competitions for about 15 years before that. And part of that was to judge a system. And you had to sit down with notes and your pen and you write out what you hear. But you also have to know how to tune a system. And you also have to use equalization to tune a car audio system to make it sound even halfway decent. You have to understand time alignment and levels and phase matching and mid bass to sub bass transition and, and a lot of these other factors that go into it. So if you know how to tune a car audio system or at least you know the basics, then you have a pretty good idea of what certain things sound like and in what frequency bands. And it makes it a little bit easier to identify. Or at the least, you know that highs sound high and lows sound low, and you just start zoning in from there. The data that you're about to see was captured using my Clipple near fill scanner. It's a state-of-the-art device that was not available when the speaker was designed. This can replace an anechoic chamber, which is what was used for this speaker's design. The minimum impedance is about three and a half ohm. Uh, what is that around? Maybe like 150 Hertz. And, and the impedance is fine, right? Like you might need a four ohm capable amplifier to drive this, especially if it's an AB amplifier. But the things that don't look good are, here's a resonance right here around 170, another one around 220, and then another one around maybe 350 Hertz or so. Here's the on-axis response and linearity. Mean SPL is 89.4 decibels. Its response linearity is within about plus or minus two decibels. This design is 20 years old and it's within about plus or minus two decibels on axis. Now, designing a speaker to measure flat on axis, not a huge deal. I mean, within plus or minus two decibels is 
is pretty freaking awesome, but it's not unheard of. The problem is what happens when you go to the side of the speaker and, and around it and above or below it. Those things matter too, and that feeds into the overall sound that you hear in your seated position, which I'll talk about shortly after I mention the F3 is at 53 hertz and the F10 is at 37 hertz. The F3 is the point where the response has fallen off by about three decibels compared to the mean. So you're three decibels lower from the overall mean at about 53 hertz, and then it's 10 decibels lower at 37 hertz, which just means that you're gonna have to use a subwoofer if you want low bass. Here's the Spinorama data. This looks really good. Again, like really smooth on-axis frequency response. Listening window also looks really good. Listening window is plus or minus 30 degrees to the side, plus or minus 10 degrees above the axis point, which is the mid-range for this speaker. The early reflections directivity index. Basically, this means how well does the speaker take to equalization? The more linear this guy is, the better it takes to equalization. And that means that if you apply equalization, you're gonna still have the same tonal balance between the direct sound, which fires directly at you, and the sound that's reflected off the walls. That's a good thing. If those don't match, which a lot of lesser speakers have issues with, then no matter how much you equalize the speaker, it's still not gonna sound exactly right because the sound that goes off the walls and comes back to your ear is different than the sound that comes directly at you. With a speaker design like this, where they paid attention to the early reflections, that means that the early reflections are going to sound similar in tonality to that direct sound. And if you, for some reason, don't like the overall sound of the speaker in your room, throw some EQ on it, shape it to make it sound like what you want. This is the estimated in-room response at zero degrees on axis and plus or minus 30 degrees horizontal. I noted the in-room extension to about 50 hertz or so. Upper mid bass punch is a bit lower in level compared to the mid range portion itself. And then the higher frequency areas is something else that I noticed too. This kind of stands out. Now, this is more close to how I heard the speaker. Some of you may hear the speaker where the tweeter sounds higher in level overall. So you may just draw this blue line a little bit further down here and have more of a gap there. And that's cool. That's where the subjective portion comes into play and in how we describe how the speaker sounds to us. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm describing how it sounded to me and relaying to you why it sounded that way. The lower treble can sound a bit bright if pointed directly on axis. So in black here, we can see that it's gonna be a bit bright right through here. Now when towed out about 30 degrees, you still have a little bit of a bump around four kilohertz or so. You can help resolve that by using some wall absorption. But I found that about 10 degrees to 15 degrees was the best midway point to get the best overall sound. This is the horizontal contour plot, which gives us an idea of what the speaker sounds like as you go away from the primary axis. So as you go from in front of the speaker to the side of it, zero degrees is in front of the speaker at the mid range to the side of it going behind it, 180 degrees this way, and then 180 degrees this way. It basically retains the same sound characteristics at about plus or minus 75 degrees. I'm going by this negative six dB color right here, this lighter red color. Once you get past that, it starts to sound less and less similar, but for the most part, still, it's keeping its overall tonality quite well, and that's a good reason for why you can equalize the speaker if you wanna make it sound a certain way without any detriment. There are other speakers where you'll have a significant hole right through here, something like that, and that would tell me that you can't equalize it in the one to two kilohertz region, so if it sounds forward and you're trying to get rid of that, you're probably not gonna resolve it completely. With this particular speaker, you can because it has good directivity, good horizontal contour. Above and below the mid-range, how far out can you go? Well, I'm saying here about plus or minus 25 degrees. Above that or below that, you start running into suckouts right through here and then right through here below the mid-range. Distortion at 86 decibels, low, and then at 96 decibels, also really low. Multi-tone distortion, however, plays a signal that's closer to music. It's not just a single tone at a time and it's kind of stressing the whole speaker at one time. The woofers, the tweeter, it's doing everything. And what happens when you play multi-tone distortion is sometimes if you're overexciting that woofer, you can create higher order distortion elements in the mid-range or even the tweeter, just depending on how low some of these speaker designs are playing. And that's why I like to use multi-tone distortion. 3% is my personal benchmark. If it goes above that, then I'm gonna say, ah, that's probably problematic. But as long as it's below that, for the most part, I'm okay. Now, I have an entire video dedicated on multi-tone distortion. If you want to go check it out, please feel free to go look for that multi-tone distortion. You can find it. What happens if I limit the excursion of the woofers to 80 hertz and above? This is what you get. I'm going to go back to full range. 
and then back to limited. And here we go. So there is lower mid-range distortion when you limit the woofer's excursion. Compression, below about 80 hertz, you really start to change things. Even at the lower compression testing of about 96 decibels at one meter, you, you know, but like 50, 60 hertz, you're just falling down. Now, in the grand scheme of these things, is it really an issue? Well, it's gonna depend. For me, I want this to be as minimal as it possibly can because if I hear a kick drum bass and it pulls bump like that, then I want it to sound as powerful at lower volume as I do at higher volume. But the other thing that we had to factor in too is that this speaker is already rolling off below about 50 hertz. And that does it for this review. I hope you, hope you watch this. I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciate it. And it's kind of fun to go back and look at old designs. I do want to mention that when I bought these, I checked them out pretty thoroughly. There was no dents, there's no surround rot, any issues mechanical that I could see. I did also measure the other speaker and it was within about one decibel to one and a half decibel overall of this speaker. The impedance plots pretty much line up pretty well together too. So I think this is a good choice for a representative of an older design. I say that because I've gotten a lot of people to request me to design, not design, to review older speakers, but in the past, I've been sent some that were older that had obviously been abused. And that's why it's not something I do routinely. But since I was there and able to see these and inspect them myself before they were sent or purchased by me, then I felt okay with them. I may do more like these in the future. If you're interested, please let me know. And if you've got some really neat speakers that are old school and you happen to live in the Huntsville, Alabama vicinity, reach out to me. Let me know. Maybe we can work something out. If you like what I'm doing here and you'd like to support, you can do that a few different ways. One is you can use my generic affiliate links to buy anything that you normally would already buy. So Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, Target, Newegg, and there's others in my description below. If you have to go buy something from Amazon or Crutchfield tomorrow, just remember, oh, Aaron has an affiliate link for that. Click that generic affiliate link and then go buy whatever it is you want. I do earn a small commission on that. And that helps me basically keep the lights on. Alternatively, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. My voice just keeps cracking. I think I'm getting sick. Anyway, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. And there you can get some behind the scenes information. I do polls. I talk to the audience there. And it's just a good way to help me out and also be part of the community in that way. And I 120 million percent appreciate all the support that I can get that way. And my Patreon community is great. With all that said, I appreciate you watching. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.